Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Eclectic Author Showcase, where authors from around the world get together for live and lively discussions of the challenges of writing and promoting their published works. This broadcast is a feature of the Eclectic Authors Showcase, which consists of a home website, a wonderful online monthly magazine, and these weekly Sunday afternoon broadcasts. Now today, Sambaland, that's me from Brazil, talks with Tinseltown. For my guest is a woman who has capped an incredibly impressive career as a theater and television actor with the creation of her first novel, which has already garnered incredible critical acclaim and has caused her to develop writer's cramp at book signings, most recently in Carmel, California. Her name is Karen Kondazian, and it is my virtually uncontrollable pleasure to welcome her now to the show. Oh, my God, what a lovely introduction. Thank you, Gordon. (laughs) You're quite welcome. Now, Karen, before we tell our listeners about your new book, The Whip, and by the way, this is not about uh, preparing eggs for an omelet. Uh, it is not. It is not about uh, certain things that go on in certain quarters in Los Angeles with dominatrix and such. Uh, but I, it's that's what it's not about. But what it is about, I'm going to let you talk about a little later. But I'd like to delve a bit into your career as a stage and TV actor, because from reading your bio, I understand that those experiences shaped in many important ways your approach to writing. And before you answer that, I should say that Karen is a member of the legendary Actors Studio, which births such iconic talents as Geraldine Page, Kim Stanley, Marlon Brando, and James Dean. So, would you tell us a little bit about your your career as an actor, Karen? Well, um, I, I'll tell you how I decided to be an actor, which was at eight years old, um, I wanted to be a spy. I guess my mother had taken me to a lot of spy movies anyway, but um, I was chosen to be one of those obnoxious little children on the Art Linkletter show, and I guess people over, what, 30, 35, 40 will know what that is. It was a show with uh, Mr. Linkletter had all little children, and then he'd ask them questions and try to embarrass their parents sort of on the air. Anyway, on the air I realized that I got to miss school. And I got to get grilled cheese sandwiches and orange sherbet, my favorite, uh, as much as I wanted. And I decided, well, if I could do that as an actor, then that was the life for me. So at eight, <laughs> old, at eight years old, I made that decision on the air. I announced I no longer wanted to be a spy, I wanted to be an actor, and I never wavered. It was like I found my calling. So I was very fortunate um, to... Uh, have great schooling. I was an exchange student in Vienna and got to study. I mean, I graduated college. My parents said, look, if you go to college and you graduate, we'll support you in New York as an actor for a little while and see how it goes. So anyway, I did go to Vienna, and then after after that I went to the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts, and so I had a wonderful kind of training, um, English training. And um, and then when I came back from England, I was very fortunate and auditioned, as you say, for the... One of my dreams was to be in the actor's studio, um, and um, I, 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 it was quite an honor because out of about, I would say at that time, Lee Strasberg was my teacher. He was the ra- man who ran it. And out of, out of about 4,000 audition- auditioners, um, they took four a year from new altogether from New York and LA and and I was one of those people so I also That's incredible got, absolutely incredible Well the lovely thing about it is you're a lifetime member and you never have to pay a penny and you're you're taught um you're coached by people like Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and uh, Ellen Burstyn you know it's 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 an extraordinary uh, gift that you're given anyway <clears throat> that's how I began and then I did New York, and <clears throat> I was lucky to then finally uh, do some television in L.A., which, um, you know, some, I play a lot some of Some television, time. by the way, includes about 50 shows. 
<laughs> well, now I got to play a lot of, and still do a bit, uh, a lot of Italian moms, Greek moms, psychics, gypsies. Oh God, if I ever see another crystal ball in front of me, that's I did a lot of those ladies, you know. <clears throat> By the way, did you ever play? Uh, did you ever play Madame Accarty in uh, *Blythe Spirit*? No, I, I'd love to do that some way. You're, you're exactly right. That's exactly the kind of roles I played, though. Those kind of eccentric ladies, you know. <laughs> right. Anyway, so now tell us a little bit about your special connection with uh, the works of my favorite American playwright, Tennessee Williams. Ah, uh, yes. Well. Here I, there I was, and I was in Los Angeles, and you know I was working, but not not the kind of work I wanted to do. I was doing, I was understudying a lot of stars um, who were playing a lot of queens at uh, you know like um, um, Richard Chamberlain uh, did a play, and I understudied the queen for Richard Chamberlain, and um, then there was Hamlet. And I understudied Gertrude. And so all of a sudden, you know, Lee Strasberg, I did a scene of the rose tattoo, Tennessee Williams' great rose tattoo that Anna Magnani had done in the movies. <clears throat> I did a scene for him, and he said, Karen, this is a play you need to do. And I thought, well, how in the world? Nobody's going to know me or anything. How am I going to do this role? Who's going to cast me? So I believe by the way, that in every problem there's a gift in its hand and we kind of create the problem so we can get the gift. Well, yes. I I got uh, into a, a sort of bad accident, was hit on the head, and went into a coma for a little part of my life, in my youth. And when I woke up, I couldn't speak really well. And anyway, all is... I, 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 you know, got well eventually, and my parents said to me, you know, Karen, we want to give you a little gift of some money. You've always wanted to do Rose Tattoo. Why don't you produce it? And so I didn't know you're supposed to get rights to things. I was a total innocent <laughs> of, of producing. I thought, oh, you yeah. could just do anything you wanted anyway. I finally did get the rights and and finally did learn about producing, and I produced the Rose Tattoo, and starred in it here in Los Angeles, and um, and I won the L.A. Drama Critics Circle Award, and meanwhile, Tennessee Williams was in town. He was going to Long Beach to see um, a play called of his called Eccentricities of a Nightingale, and yes. he happened to be in town, and a friend of mine asked me what I wanted for my birthday, and I teased him and said, well, Tennessee Williams to come to see the play. Anyway, this friend who was who did uh, interviews on television actually got Williams to come. And um, it, it was an extraordinary night because um, who was invited were a young man who was going to be Superman, Christopher Reeve. He was just, the movie was just going to be released. Nobody knew him yet, really, unless you've seen him on, on stage. Um, Richard Brooks, who directed um, the movies of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and, and Sweet Bird of Youth, had never met Tennessee Williams, even though he had directed him, uh, directed the, the plays on film. And so he was there, and a lot of extraordinary people. Anyway, that night was uh, uh, backstage. Before I went on stage, I thought to myself, if I can survive this, I can get through anything. Um, and it went very well. Uh, it was a wonderful Q&A after. And Williams really liked my work a lot, and he liked me, and we kind of hit it off. I mean, I'll never forget a funny story. Um, <clears throat> I was at a, uh, the – before I met him uh, officially, I was sitting at the Los Angeles Drama Critic Circle – a party before the awards, and he was there actually. And he kept, st I had a lot of cleavage, and he kept staring at my cleavage. Well, we know Mr. Williams, as everyone knows, that he's, he's gay. And so I thought, what in the world is he staring at my cleavage for? Anyway, somebody introduced us, and he, we both stood up, and he said, <clears throat> Listen, 
Um, <clears throat> I've been looking at that, those, that beautiful cleavage of yours. Uh, may I touch them? And my mouth <laughs> dropped open. And I said, of course. So he put his hands very gently and nicely on my breast. And um, he went, mm, I'll take them, gift wrapped. Anyway, it was so <laughs> funny. And he was so funny. And he was so charming. Anyway, we became great friends out of that. And he gave me the rights to all his plays while he was alive. So that was amazing, and I, you refer to it in your autobiography, your your biography on your wonderful website as he gave you carte blanche, and I thought blanche was very appropriate considering that's one of his great heroines in Streetcar Named Desire. Oh my God, you're so funny! I never even thought of that. Look at you. <laughs> so you know, take take blanche wherever you want, carte blanche. <laughs> oh my God, that's lovely. <laughs> Anyway, the next play I did, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little allergy, so I hope no the audience... No <clears throat> So, the next play I did was um, Sweet Bird of Youth with an up-and-coming young actor who had never done film yet, but his name was Ed Harris, and he played Chance Wayne, and he was amazing. And it was the first time in Los Angeles that there was frontal nudity with a man on stage. Well, I, the play opened with a shower running, and all of a sudden out of the shower walked this beautiful, young, well-made <laughs> man <laughs> named Ed Harris, <laughs> who um, the audiences gasped, and every every night we would wait about a minute or two while we would hear in the audience... Um, a young lady going, no, I want to stay. And a man going, come on, get up. No, I want to stay. Get up. We're leaving. And so all of this, every night, some man would drag some poor woman out of the theater. I, it was so funny that now we're used to all of that. But in those days, to see, you know, a naked man on stage for a minute, it was just a minute, um, you know, it was a big shock, I guess, especially to the men. <laughs> so that was well, kind of some, fun. Sometimes comparisons are odious, and men can't can't <laughs> handle them. Oh, you're funny. <laughs> anyway, um, so that started. You know, it, it actually that actually these plays actually started my career, that because a television career, because um, then I started. I got a series and started working quite a lot in television and, and theater. So, um, you know, when I said that in every problem there's a gift in its hand, if if I hadn't had the the, the um, illness, uh, the accident, I don't think my parents would have given me the money, and I don't think I would have produced Williams and met Williams and started winning, you know, some nice awards. Um, and a career was started out of an accident. Well, I think that's, that's the definition of serendipity. Yes. Now, and obviously, we could go on, Karen, For since we're both <laughs> theater buffs. We could go on for – I, I even have my own Tennessee Williams uh, uh, story about when he came to see a play that I was in. But we're not going to go there. We're going to talk oh, about oh, this just wonderful me. twist oh, wait in a minute, your career. I'll tell you over the phone later. Just tell me what the play was that he came to. Camino Real. Oh my God! You weren't. In I play. Texas. I played. I played the waiter, and it was produced by the Columbia University Players, where I was enrolled at the time. And uh, uh, he came, and he watched the play dutifully. And uh, apparently, during the uh, performance, he uh, he uh, partook liberally from a, a flask. Aww. And he was overheard to say, "There's only one Ilya Kazan." which didn't oh. make our director feel all that great. Oh, no. Well, oh, my God. But, was, but let's get back honest. to the whip. I, yeah, I'm determined I mean, to get back was, to the whip. Yes, back to the whip. Okay, this whatever the you say. This is the exciting new twist, new twist and turn in, in your career, which is, as they say, is, I think is remarkable. And uh, uh, why don't you give us a, a little background uh, about what the whip is about? I've told the listeners what it's not about, so you tell okay. us what it is about. Okay, it's uh, you know there's a little synopsis that I tell. It's it's pretty quick, but um, 
it, 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 it's inspired by a true story um, of a woman, Charlotte Charlie Parkhurst, who lived in 1812 through 1879, um, and she lived most of her extraordinary life as a man in the Old West. And as a young woman in Rhode Island, she um, she fell in love with a runaway slave, and she had his child. And, you know, this was pre-Civil War. So the, anyway, the destruction of her family drove her west to California, dressed as a man, to track the killer. And Charlie became a renowned stagecoach driver for Wells Fargo, and she killed the famous outlaw Sugarfoot, who robbed her stagecoach one too many times. She had a secret love affair, and she lived with a housekeeper who was unaware of her true sex and fell in love with her. And that's kind of a quick uh, summary of the story. Well, I must say, combining the Old West, uh, gender reversal, and uh, mixed racial sex is a pretty potent brew. And uh, it's no wonder that the book has received such uh, wonderful notices. Uh, from uh, on Amazon, and also before I forget, if you want to know more about this this wonderful book and this wonderful woman, I have three sources to recommend. One is a review of the Whip, written by Norman Goldman, who is the founder of my favorite book reviewing site, www.bookpleasures.com. The second is an interview, a print interview with Karen, also appearing on bookpleasures.com, conducted by the same Norman Goldman. And third is is Karen's own fantastic website. I, you're immediately hit with a lovely rendition of As Time Goes By from Casablanca, and which makes the, the information go down really easily. But it's a wonderful website, and it's www.karen.pondazian.com. Are there any other uh, sources that you would recommend, uh, Karen, to to get the get the straight poop on you and your works? Well, actually, the first one is my personal website where I have a lot of you know. There's about the book and everything, but the book's website is www.thewhipnovel.com. So it's T H E N O. So it's a T H E N O V E L. Um, the whip. Oh, so it's the whip novel. You know, like just spell the whip novel dot right. com, and it's another website. Right. I mean to go on and on, but it's a little it's a little tricky. Um, and on that is you know you can link on to Amazon or Barnes and Noble. You can also order it in bookstores, but the easiest way and actually the cheapest because you can also get an ebook if that's your fancy. I happen to like hard books, but. You can get ebooks as well as the hard copy, and somebody told me you can get on iTunes. Oh my God, you can read it on your iPhone. Can you imagine reading a book on an iPhone? I can't imagine it, but I know someone who did. So well, there are all kinds of sources to get it. But uh, the, one of the great honors of the for the book was that it was um, it was featured on the cover of. Uh, Publishers Weekly. Publishers Weekly. I noticed that. I was yeah. most impressed. To get a review on Publishers Weekly is is hard enough, but to be on the cover is incredible, and I give you every congratulation for that. And one of the no. lovely things about that is that then then it goes into libraries, which is, is my love. Um, I know I don't make money from that, but I don't care, because libraries, with all my heart, are where I learn to love books, as a kid, and where a lot of people who can't afford to buy books get the chance to read their heart's desire. And, um, I mean, I get books from all, I mean, write, people write to me, and I hear all the time that they've read the book through a library, and it just it makes me very happy. Well, you should be. Now, Karen, I, I'm the great timekeeper here. I see okay. um, there are two things that I've was really looking forward to. Uh, one was a uh, you reading a couple of excerpts from the book, and the other, uh, Karen, I think maybe the first author we've ever had on the Eclectic Author Showcase that actually has an audio version of her book, which I think is terribly exciting. So I have a feeling that we're not going to have time for both. So why don't you choose which, which uh, in the next, say, eight minutes, which do you think how the time could be best spent in, in, in acquainting our listeners with the actual text or sound of some of the book, The Whip. 
Well, I'll tell you what. I don't. I'm not sure. I wish I could ask the audience. Um, yes, in in uh, December the audio book will be released, and the woman reading it was the star of Deadwood. Uh, her name is Robin Weikert, and she played Calamity Jane on on uh, Deadwood. Um, by the way, I must tell you that the book has a lot of bad language because that's how they spoke in those days, and also um, but some violence. But just you know, I want to say one thing that's important to me, and that is that. I'm going to ask the audience, the listeners, a question, and because the river that runs through through the book, the theme is this question: What would you do if someone destroyed horribly everything that you love in this world? Could you forgive them? And if you couldn't, how far could you go? I'll tell you what: I will read a little chunk. Um, and maybe um, what they'll do is they can buy the audio book. She's so wonderful. Um, when it comes out, it will be, you know, oh, yes. digital as well as uh, something you can put in your car. Um, I've heard a part of it, and she is indeed a wonderful interpreter, but you can be the most wonderful interpreter in the world if you don't have the basic material to interpret. It doesn't mean much, and you certainly supplied her with that. Thank you so much. Well, I will read... Um, there's two parts. Let's see if we have enough time. Um, the first part is a little sad. The second part is very funny. Um, so the first part is Charlie has her family's been killed. She's now dressed in men's clothes, and she's going to be going on her way to find the killer in in California from the East Coast. Her name was Charlotte. Remember that, please. Charlotte rode down the main street of Providence. Byron's old hat pulled low over her forehead. She rode past Mrs. Bidwell's boarding house and the bookstore. She rode past Bronson's general store. Mr. Bronson was opening the shutters of the horse and its rider. He noticed nothing out of the ordinary. He glanced up at the click clocking, and then his eyes slid back down to his hands, fastening the shutters on the pesky hooks under the clapboards. The horse had looked inconsequential, the rider had looked inconsequential. The hooves clopped in the usual way. She tried to take this all in, that the woman in her had died in anguish, an eventual man had been born in her place, apparently brooked no notice of the universe, nor had the universe even blinked in the absorption into itself of her tragedy. It was astonishing to her that the sun had re-risen and shone down on them all in the same way as always before, that the townspeople weren't transfixed in shock, dumbfounded, changed outright at the death of the old world and the hollow, hopeless replacement offered in exchange. No, their lives seemed to be moving on as usual. Charlotte looked around her in dismay. The townspeople were all of them just the same as any other day. How could that be? She rode on past the crumbling brick buildings and the peeling white houses. <gasps> Everything was temporary. She understood that now. All of this was temporary. It would be snatched away. It was it was all on loan. Even the people we love, they were all on loan. One day you see their face across a rickety table, or you pass them hurrying from here to there, or you see them leave you in your bed, and their profile passes you by. And you don't know your thoughts somewhere else. And then they're snatched away forever. And you did not know to say goodbye. You did not know. It was going to be a bracing autumn day. The leaves were glimmering in the early light. They'd been turning crisp in the cold nights and rattled now with the breeze. They were orange, gold, and red. In her old life, she might have called it glorious. But now... She knew the truth about all this beauty. And if we have a little time, I'll read a couple. Well, of speaking the of beauty, speaking yeah. of beauty, that was totally beautiful. Uh, Cadence, uh, uh, I, I kept thinking, though, of what a wonderful <laughs> audio version of the book you could have done. But that's okay. Robin's a, Robin's a name, so let's go oh, with yeah. Robin. But that was really lovely. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that with us, Karen. Do you think we have time? We have uh, about four minutes. Okay. I have just a couple of stagecoach rules here that are very funny. And okay, let's do it. 
So the next time, you can interrupt me, by the way, when the time gets uh, close. Um, next time you're on a stagecoach, you better adhere to these rules. <laughs> um, number one, abstinence from liquor is requested. But if you must drink, share the bottle. To do otherwise makes you appear <laughs> selfish and unneighborly. If ladies are present, gentlemen are urged to forego smoking cigars and pipes, as the odor of same is repugnant to the gentle sex. Chewing tobacco is permitted, but spit with the wind, not against it. <laughs> Buffalo robes are provided for your comfort during cold weather. Hogging robes will not be tolerated, and the offender will be made to ride with the driver. Firearms may be kept on your person for use in emergencies. Do not fire them for pleasure or shoot at wild animals, as the sound riles the horses. In the event of runaway horses, <laughs> remain calm. Leaping from the coach in panic will leave you injured, at the mercy of elements, hostile Indians, and hungry wolves. If the team runs away, sit still and take your chances. Forbidden topics of discussion are stagecoach robberies and Indian uprisings. Also, don't discuss politics or religion, nor point out places on the road where horrible murders have been committed. And finally, expect annoyance, discomfort, and some hardships. If you are disappointed, thank heavens. There are many, many more. I just read you part of them. So, well, doesn't that make everybody just want to take a stagecoach ride right away? <laughs> Especially in California. <laughs> I think I those I... are those are really lovely. I thought they were inspired uh, and and so very very droll. I know, uh, but they meant them seriously. That's what's so funny. Um, oh, I mean, I'm sure. Especially the spinning of the tobacco. That's a real <laughs> helpful piece of advice. I wish we had time for Robin Weikert, but because apparently boy, it's not it's, it's, apparently it's not just pissing that's not supposed to be done in the wind. <laughs> oh my God! Anyway, so um, I, I well so, let's, let's let me yes? see if I can uh, for the future. Let me see if I have uh, Robin's link, and maybe I can figure out a way to uh, or or maybe Norman Goldman, the ever uh, the ever. Uh, Resourceful, Norman can yes. figure out a way of getting a piece of that onto uh, onto bookpleasures dot com because I think uh, I've listened to it and it, it, it's it's wonderful. So yes. uh, that's something we should think about for the future. But now uh, we are coming down to the the short strokes here. I want to, besides thanking Karen for sharing her wonderful career and her delightful sense of humor with us today, I also want to. Say Karen is a world traveler. She has taken a couple of epic cruises. I think she has uh, visited most of the wonders of the world, uh, with the possible exception of the Great Wall of China. I think she's covered all seven wonders of the world. And, and after this interview, I consider Karen sort of the eighth. <laughs> oh, my God. I send you so, pictures. <laughs> so you. come back and, and join us anytime, uh, Karen. We'd love to have you, and thank you again for your for your Thank time, you. your talents, your career, and the whip. Thank you very much. And by the way, the whip was a stagecoach driver, so everybody knows finally what that title means. What the whip is. <laughs> well, it, I'm sure it's a great relief to all of us. <laughs> yes, everybody now knows it's a stagecoach driver, the whip. <laughs> well, thank you again, Karen. And for our listeners, be sure to join us every Sunday at this time and station. We have some really great guests coming up, and I think you'll enjoy them as much, uh, but probably not as much, <laughs> as we've all had a good time with Karen. So cheerio, and have a wonderful week, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.